Yes, a treaty is possible. I'm optimistic that we can get there in a way that doesn't at all cross any sovereignty, jurisdiction or control red lines. Uh, but I want to preserve the confidentiality of the negotiations. That's important because if you start to go outside that confidentiality, then it's, uh, it's giving a license to other parties to go outside of that confidentiality also. And I think one of the ways that we ensure that we keep alive the possibility of this treaty really being something that we can achieve is by preserving that confidentiality. So you'll see that in the evidence that I gave to the Select Committee, I was talking about concepts, I was talking about issues, which I've already dealt with in Gibraltar on a number of occasions in different parliamentary debates, etc. Uh, but I haven't gone into what is happening in the negotiations. I don't think that would be proper uh, there or here with you this morning. You said a treaty unlikely, I think, were the words you used before the end of the year, but while there's agreement and hope there are extensions? So uh, there doesn't have to be an extension because there isn't a hard and fast time limit of the end of the year. We have not set a cliff edge timetable like that on the 31st of December. I, I learned from the way that the British government dealt with the, the cliff edges for the TCA and, and the Commission, that that was not going to be in our interest. I think all parties understood that. There was no need for a hard cliff edge in the context of Gibraltar. There may come a time when we all decide that we have to set a date by which we do things, but that is not yet the 31st of December. What I'm saying is that I believe that we will likely reach agreement before the end of the year, but that to spin up the treaty text and to have that text approved by all of the entities that will be involved here and then ratified is something that I don't see happen before the end of the year. So I think we need to achieve the final agreement between the United Kingdom and Gibraltar of the one part and the European Union and Spain of the other part before the end of the year, if we can, at least on the key issues, and then use the first part of next year, I would have thought just the first quarter of next year, to finalise that in the treaty legal text, in all of the other ancillary texts that may be necessary, and then put those in place by the, by the end of the first 90 days of the year. Do you think extension of mitigating measures will be a problem? I don't think that will be a problem. I think that is something that all parties that are coming at this in good faith or want to see continue to be the case. If we have been able to reach agreement before the end of the year, then there's very good reason to spill over into next year with the work that we're doing on treaty text and with the mitigate, mitigating measures in place that may be necessary in that context. Indeed, if, if you ask me, I would perhaps even venture to suggest that if we have reached agreement before the end of the year, instead of just having mitigating measures in place, we may start to see de facto implementation of things which we have agreed as we move towards full ratification and full implementation of things. So I'm optimistic in that sense. It appears that you're up against it with the UK when it comes to EU involvement, something which isn't really an issue domestically. So I think that you need to understand what the different dynamic between the government of the United Kingdom and the government of, of Gibraltar may be in the context of our views of the European Union and how we've been able to work together despite that. And, and this is really where we have understood that there was a meeting of minds between the government of Gibraltar and the government of the United Kingdom, that we needed to move forward with the result of the referendum after 2016. We needed to move forward also after the withdrawal agreement um, and that there are no reasons why the positions of the UK government, the wider British foreign policy interests as they may be today, in particular in the context of the European Union, and the positions of the government of Gibraltar need to conflict in the context of the negotiation and the treaty that we're doing. I think we are all in the same place and that from that same place we can deliver the treaty that Gibraltar needs without any difficulty if there is the genuine engagement that I believe there is now from the European Commission and from Spanish colleagues. It was pretty obvious though from comments at the, at the scrutiny committee that they believe that they've left the UK, that that means no involvement with the EU and they don't want involvement with the EU on a British territory. The European Scrutiny Committee is uh, not the British government, of course. It is uh, a committee made up of backbench members of the uh, United Kingdom Parliament. Uh, they are expressing their views as to what is or is not appropriate. And although we had an engagement on the subject of the direct jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, as I indicated, 
communicated to them, although we could theoretically go around the houses on that issue for as long as they liked, I don't think that what they were concerned about actually becomes an issue in the context of the treaty anyway, because first of all, that's not our litmus test for whether the treaty transgresses sovereignty or not. Um, and second, we don't think that direct effect of the European Court of Justice is the issue um, that is going to really bring us to uh, loggerheads in the context of the treaty, uh, because there will be a different dispute resolution mechanism that will be appropriate for the treaty that we have, which will not necessarily require even the uh, engagement or debate with the U European Commission in the context of the ECJ. But if we had to have ECJ, then I think you're right to say that the attitude of the people of Gibraltar is slightly different to the attitude that you might find in the European Scrutiny Committee in the Westminster Parliament today, especially when that Scrutiny Committee didn't have before me on, uh, on Wednesday any Labour members or any members from the Liberal Party and had principally, apart from the SNP member who, who was there, uh, members of the Conservative Party. And the reason for that is that many Labour members believe that the work of the Scrutiny Committee is done and that it should not continue to operate. And, and this is part of the politics also. The European Scrutiny Committee is a committee set up to scrutinise European directives at a time that the United Kingdom is a member of the European Union and how the United Kingdom is transposing those into law in the UK. Now, because this emanation of European law called the treaty, um, the TCA treaty exists, they have said that they want to continue to look at those issues. But that is also a live political issue in Westminster between the political parties. Two separate immigration zones and Gibraltar only visas. Uh, what's the significance of this and is perhaps one of the key issues separation of jurisdiction? So this is an issue that I dealt with extensively, uh, I recall, um, when I appeared on Viewpoint or Direct Democracy. I think it was a special viewpoint that GBC held on the issue of the New Year's Eve agreement, and we went through a lot of the clauses of the NYE, and there I was able to refer your viewers to Article 25 of the Visa Regulation, which provides for those visas of limited territorial application, which can be granted in very defined circumstances by a member state of Schengen, where the application is not for a Schengen-wide visa. So there are different ways in which you deal with the fact that you are two separate zones. We may or may not be able to come to a different arrangement which will be easier for travellers in the context of the negotiation that is ongoing. Uh, but I think it's important that people have conceptually in their minds the understanding that Gibraltar is not going to be part of Schengen, although that may be what rolls off the tongue because de facto you'll have that ability to move between the two immigration zones. Gibraltar will in fact be a separate immigration zone with a common travel area with Schengen. And the example of Ireland is an important one because Ireland and the United Kingdom at the border with Northern Ireland have this common travel area. Once you're in Ireland, if you arrive from the United States into Ireland, you are in London. You can go from Dublin to London without having to show your immigration documentation again. If you fly into London from New York, you can go to Dublin without having to show your immigration documentation again. And Ireland is not in Schengen. So they have a common travel area with the UK, but not with the Schengen zone. What we're saying is, well, we haven't got a common travel area with the UK. We never have had a common travel area with the UK in persons or indeed in goods. We've never been in the customs union with the UK. Um, and Schengen, which is the separate immigration zone where Spain starts, is where we believe our common travel area should be now in our post-EU membership uh, incarnation. But it's a separate immigration zone. Ireland can set a different immigration policy to the immigration policy that the United Kingdom might set since the common travel area was fixed in 1922. That is the sort of arrangement that we're looking at doing and not becoming members of Schengen or being a part of Schengen, but being a fluid immigration zone alongside Schengen. Chief Minister, finally, you confident of a treaty, we've established that, confident of a treaty that would be acceptable to the people of Gibraltar? Um, a treaty that is not acceptable to the people of Gibraltar is not acceptable to the cabinet that I lead. Remember that the hawks, the real hawks, the ones who have the uh, legacy 
of the past 35 years, 40 indeed in the context of Sir Joe Bosano, uh, 49 and, uh, and a half years of defending Gibraltar's sovereignty of the people who sit in the cabinet today. There's no one who can pretend that the GSLP Liberal Cabinet is a cabinet that is soft on Spain or soft on sovereignty or any of these issues. So I know that we are the guardians of the responsibility of those who have long wanted to ensure that there is not one iota of a concession on an issue of sovereignty. Um, and I know, therefore, that if it passes muster with my cabinet, it passes muster with the people of Gibraltar. Um, and you know, nothing that uh, I say in the negotiations, nothing that my cabinet proposes that we say in the negotiations is going to be contrary to that. I've often said, and, and you may have heard me say before privately, uh, that my government is unfortunately a little one-dimensional. What we say in public is what we say in private, in particular when it comes to the fundamental issue of the sovereignty of our people and of Gibraltar.